read them all, amen. But we see you, we love you, and we praise God for you, amen. And so God is, is working the work in Israel, amen. As we look at, at Genesis uh, 36, uh, Genesis 36 and 1, we have to remember what we're talking about, amen, this morning. We're talking about Edom, uh, the roots of Rome. Edom, the roots of Rome. And as we get ready, amen, the Lord just reminded me, amen, to just ask you to check out, amen, me and First Lady's uh, little new interview uh, 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 theme that we're doing. We're probably going to be doing this uh, maybe once or, or twice a week, um, just talking about different topics, amen, from our family's perspective and from um, years in ministry, some 20, I mean, some 12, 13 years in ministry, probably 20 altogether uh, before I began pastoring, amen. And so we talked about sonship, uh, and that has to do with the role of authority in, in a man's life. And so we talked about that a little bit. We want you to tune in and watch that. But also we want you to email us topics that you might have uh, that you might want us to talk about. Topics, uh, I don't know, things in, in marriage, things in raising your kids, things in business, amen. Just send us a topic and we'll just sit down and just kind of kind of run it, just kind of talk about it, amen, using scripture, amen, and whatever uh, 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 illumination the Most High gives us, amen, and the multitude of counsel as wisdom, and maybe, hey, God, the Most High might speak to your situation. So check out the videos and also email us, amen, any topics that you might have that you want us to talk about, amen. So, so let's begin, y'all. We've been talking about Edom and uh, a lot of theologians think that Edom is no longer in existence. Um, but we found that with our Hebrew Israelite brothers and also, amen, uh, the Ashkenazis, amen, they also believe that Edom is still in existence. And they, they do well to believe it as I've researched it and studied it, amen, with my extra time that I have on my hands, um, Edom is here. And we looked at the apocryphal scripture of 2nd Ezra. Uh, 6 9, amen. And uh, Ezra's told us, which is the prophet Ezra, he said, For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that follows. And so, if we're having scriptures and historical references, prophets of the Most High God like Ezra telling us that Esau, Edom is going to be here till what? Till the end of the world. <laughs> Whether we know Edom is here or not, Edom is here. Amen. And we're going to look at it, amen, from a standpoint, amen, from the beginning of it till, all, uh, till the end. And that's why we started last time. Um, I gave you the points that we were going to be going through in this particular series. Uh, we had three points that we gave you, two nations, Zepho and Exodus. Uh, we've covered the first point, two nations. And we went back to the birth, the birth of Edom, which was Esau. Uh, Jacob and Esau uh, being in their mom's womb, amen, two nations struggling even in the womb. Uh, we saw Abraham and Shem's prophecy about the two nations. Uh, Shem said, amen, uh, uh, the two nations, the earth is not going to be able to sustain or keep the two nations. And he told uh, mama, he said that, Rebecca, how can you keep them in your womb if the earth not going to be able to keep them and sustain them together peaceably? So we talked about their birth. We talked about Abraham's prophecy that the elder should serve the younger. Looking deeper into it, as long as the younger keeps seeking after God and keeps a pure heart before the Most High, bringing into context the Deuteronomy 28 curses, if we would leave the most high, everything is just making sense. It's just click clacking together. We've also talked about Esau selling his birthright uh, because Esau's worldview would be governed by the flesh and by sin, while Jacob's worldview would be governed by the word of God, the Torah. Uh, we saw and also noticed Jacob, as though it were, being so caught up on the blessing because of his faith, just believing in the blessing so much that he actually... Uh, 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 first off, buys the blessing from Esau when Esau was famished and he came with that, that cuvillon or he came with that, that pot of red beans and he, he bought the birthright, amen. 
And even after that, he dressed up like Esau and stole the blessing. If you remember when we talked about the blessing, we saw and noticed inside Esau's blessing that he wouldn't be the one who would have the dew of heaven upon him and the fatness of the earth coming out from under him. No, but he would be the one that would live off his sword. He wouldn't get the blessing himself from the Most High, but he would get the blessing for himself by the sword. But you got to understand the old adage, he that lives by the sword dies by the sword. You got to be careful how you get your blessings in life because how you get your blessings is the only way you're going to be able to keep your blessings. And so we've noticed Esau, if you look in the earth, there is a people who take the blessings that they get by force. Amen. And, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Living by the sword, taking land by the sword, taking uh, 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 riches by the sword. But we'll talk about that a little bit later as we bring to fullness the revelation of Edom. So uh, we talked about the perpetual hatred of Esau against Jacob. And we'll go into that a little bit more. Amen. In the book of Jubilees, Esau actually tells Jacob, I'm not going to stop till I root you out. Until I uh, uh, take your name out of the earth. Until people don't even remember who you are anymore. And we can see that happening even now. And uh, the Lord spoke to me in a dream. I've been having vivid dreams lately since we have all this time to be with him. Uh, and to just sit in his presence. And the Most High woke me up and he showed me something. He showed me, he said, look how the Hebrews are treated. How they are whited out. How even in history, their image and their name is erased from even the exploits that they have accomplished. The Most High told me that that systematic erasing of your face, of your heritage, of your history is rooted in a hatred. It's rooted in a hatred of you, a hatred of who you are, a hatred of how you look, and it's a hatred that runs deep, that runs far back. It's not a hatred that's built upon the civil rights movement. It's not a hatred that's built even in slavery. It's a hatred that goes back to the biblical days. It goes back to the days of Abraham, the days of Isaac, in the days of Jacob. That's why you treat it the way you treat it. Because it's a perpetual hatred. And I'll share with you some more about that hatred as the message goes on. We saw the war between Jacob and Esau. When Joseph went to bury Jacob. A war ensued because Esau lied and said that the tomb... Abraham's tomb was his when he had actually sold it to Jacob, and Jacob had the paperwork. So a war ensued, and in the book of Jasher, we saw Esau lose his life, and Edom get defeated in this war. And Joseph is actually able to bury Jacob in the tomb Machpelah by Abraham and Sarah. Esau is killed, but his memory, his way of life, his beliefs, his opinions, and also his hatred lives on. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in this section that we're about to cover. And so lest I digress, and not to hold you too long, let's talk about our second point of the series. We're going to talk about Zepho. Somebody say that with me out there. Zepho. All right. To understand who Zepho is, we go back to Genesis 36, and we're going to look at verse 1 a little bit. And this is going to describe the descendants of Esau, Esau's children. The Bible tells us, now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. Esau is Edom, both words meaning red. Uh, it tells us who he married. Esau took wives, so the daughters of Canaan. Esau married Gentiles. Remember, Rebekah was, was distraught about this. 
Isaac was distraught about this. But remember, his worldview is sin. His worldview is the flesh. He doesn't want to do what God wants him to do. He wants to do what he wants to do. And so instead of going and marrying the descendants of Abraham and Isaac, amen, he marries Canaanites. And, and it's not wrong to marry a Gentile. Don't get me wrong. It's not, that's not it. But it's wrong to be unequally yoked. And so what Esau did, he forsook his godly heritage and married idolaters. He married people who worship false gods, and therein was the problem. Amen. Not the race, but the religion. Amen. Uh, 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 not the girl, but the god of the girl. That was the problem. And so he married, amen, some Canaanite women, Adda and Ohalibama. Ohalibama, all right? Uh, one was a Hittite. Uh, the other one was a Hivite. In verse 3, it tells us, and Bashamath, uh, uh, a daughter of Ishmael, all right? And so in verse 4, it tells us his children. His first wife, Ada, all right, she bare to Esau a man by the name of Eliphaz, all right? And that's where we want to stop, Eliphaz, okay? That's the first son of Esau with his first wife. Go to verse 8. It says, thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. It tells us where Esau lived since he was kicked out of pretty much the promised land. He lived in Mount Seir. And I have a map, amen, if Brent wants to just flash that on the screen. It's just to the south of Judah. That's the kingdom of Edom. That's Mount Seir for all of our geography specialists, amen, that's listening, amen. Um, and now we get into Eliphaz's children. Verse 9, and this is where we want to pay attention. So Esau, Eliphaz, and we're going to talk about Eliphaz's children. Here it is. Uh, and these are the generations of Esau, the father of the Edomites, Edomites in Mount Seir. Verse 10, these are the names of Esau's sons. Eliphaz and Raul, or Ruel, some people would say. Uh, verse 11, the sons of Eliphaz were Timon, Omar, Look at my name right there, Omar, all right? Don't you be looking at me funny. Oh, he got to eat in my name. Y'all all got to eat in my names up in there, all right? Y'all all got, all, I'll show you in a second. Y'all all got Gentile names up in here, all right? So, yeah, my name is in there. So, Tima, Omar, amen? But watch this next one. This is important. Zepho, all right? Esau, Eliphaz, and who? Zepho, Okay? Now, Zepho, amen, is, is a warrior, okay? Give you a little history on him. He's a warrior. And we'll see him, amen, uh, coming to being, coming to his own as a general, as a captain, amen? He's a mighty man, all right? Uh, he's the grandson of Esau, and he's a fighter. He's so much of a fighter, when Joseph comes down to bury Jacob and the battle ensues, they have to kill Esau, but Zepho is fighting so hard, they got to take him prisoner. Joseph takes him prisoner. Joseph knows, I can't leave Zepho right here. He took Zepho, and some of Zepho's men took him prisoner and brought him back to Egypt as well. That's the story, and you can check that out in the book of Jasher. Amen. Um, well, after Joseph dies, and the Pharaoh dies that knows Egypt, Zepho is not as important because Joseph is gone. Joseph knows the value of Zepho because he's a warrior. And you don't keep a warrior out there if he got war in his blood and hate in his blood. So he took him prisoner for peace. All right? But when Joseph dies, Jasher 60 in verse 1, I don't have it up there, but go check it out on your own. Zepho escapes from Egypt. Oh, my God. And you got to understand, he's already bred in hatred because his grandpa had a prejudice, had a racism against Israel, Esau, all right? Not only did Esau have a prejudice, but I'm sure Eliphaz, when you grow up in a prejudice environment, a racist environment, a hate environment, it's no surprise that hate moves down the generations. It's a generational bondage. It's a generational sin. So Zepho has this, this art 
against the children of Israel, all right, from Esau. He watches them kill his grandfather Esau. Then they take him and put him in jail in Egypt. How do you think Zepho feels about the children of Israel? He hates them and probably hates them even more than his grandpa Esau. Revenge is on his heart. And we'll see that revenge is on his heart for the rest of his life, for the rest of his days. Every waking hour that Zepho has, he's going to be consumed with one thought. I got to get Israel back for killing my grandpa and for putting me in this jail in Egypt for all this time. You see? You got to understand, if your worldview is God, Joseph was in jail in Egypt too, but look how he came out of jail. He came out of jail better, not bitter. But Zepho's in jail. His worldview is the flesh and sin. He comes out of jail not better, but bitter and full of hatred. And so if we can look at Jasher 61 and 5, it tells us that Zepho escapes. He doesn't go back to Edom. He escapes into Africa. All right? Egypt is in Africa anyway. And so Zepho escapes into Africa. There is a king in Africa by the name of Angeus, very important historical figure. Angeus, he sees the value of Zepho. He sees that Zepho is a warrior. And he said, I need a warrior on my team. He makes Zepho a general in his army, a captain in his army. And look at it in 61.5. And Zepho, the son of who? Of Eliphaz, who's the son of Esau. Captain of the host of Angeas, king of Denhaba. He's, he's a captain now. He's a, he's a general in the army. But look what he was doing to this king of Africa. He was daily enticing Angeas to prepare for battle, to fight against who? The sons of Jacob who were in Egypt. That hate was still there. Now you done moved on. You're out of jail. You got a good job. But your heart still want to go fight. The sons of Jacob for killing your grandpa, for locking you up, for stealing the birthright, for taking the blessing. Hatred still abides. This brother has a root of bitterness to the third degree. All right? But Angeas was unwilling to do this thing. Angeas, the king of Africa, didn't want to fight the sons of Jacob in Egypt. For his servants had related to him all the might of the sons of Jacob. And what they had done unto them in their battle with the children of Esau. And Jesus had a good mind. He said, oh, no, I ain't going to fight Israel. Because I done heard about what they've done when you get them started. You know, the quiet ones is the ones you got to watch. You know, the ones who don't want to fight is the ones that once you get them going, you can't stop them fighting. You understand what I'm saying? And I, I had a few names pop in my head just now. I was about to name a minister, but I ain't going to name them. Amen. Once you get them started, you don't want to stop them. All right? And that's the children of Israel. So when Jesus said, he said, no, nah, I ain't going to mess with them. I'm going to leave them alone. But it burnt Zepho up. I can't even get, I can't even pick a fight against the children of Israel. And Jasher 61, 6, and Zepho was in those days, he was daily enticing Angeas to fight with the sons of Jacob. King, let's go get them. Let's go fight. Verse 7. And after some time, you know, when somebody bothered you enough, amen, hallelujah, uh, uh, you actually see it their way. After some time, Angeas, he hearkened to the words of Zepho because a whisperer separated chief friends. You can so long take somebody bumping in your ears about another person before you start disliking the person. And Angeas, he ain't got no history with Israel, but this person bumping in his ears, he like, yeah, let's go fight with him. All right? But Angeas says, before we go fight, I need to do something. In verse 8 of Jasher 61, and amongst the servants of Angeas, there was a youth. Watch this, very important. 15 years old, and his name was... Balaam, the son of Beor. You see, in our Bible, we get just half the story of Balaam. We don't even get half. We get a quarter. We don't even get a quarter. We get 10%. We get a little story about Balaam, and he's uh, 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 trying to curse the people of Israel and why not puts a blessing on Israel, and that's all we get. But we see Moses 
he is anathema to Balaam. We see Moses constantly talking about Balaam. And I, in my heart, I say to myself when I was reading my Bible without these historical contexts, amen, I'm like, Moses, why are you so mad at Balaam? He ain't do nothing but bless y'all. But I only had 10% of the story. You see, Balaam, since 15 years old, was an enemy of Israel. In this text in Joshua, we only introduced to Balaam as a young man. But from 15 years old onward, Till the end of the life of Balaam, he will forever be the, nemesis, the, the nemesis of, of Israel. And this is just the beginning right here. And it just enlightened my mind. It broadened my horizon to see Balaam 15 years old in this story. So the king of Africa, Angeas, provoked by Esau's grandson, Zepho, is about to go fight with Israel for nothing. While Israel is in Egypt. But before he goes, he gets this young man, 15 years old, Balaam, and he tells Balaam, because Balaam has some gifts. What's the gift of Balaam? Uh, Balaam, the son of Beor, was his name. And the youth was very wise, and he understood what? The art of what? Witchcraft. He was a witch. All right, he was a witch. If you want to put it generally accurate, he was a warlock. He knew the dark magic, the dark secrets. And this is a real thing, all right? Just like there's forces of good in the world, there's forces of evil, and witches still exist, you see? But Balaam, all right, in verse 9, look what it says. And Andrew said unto Balaam, conjure for us, I pray thee, with the witchcraft, that we may know who will prevail in this battle to which we are now proceeding. Now, he goes to Balaam to predict the future. And Balaam is about to use an old witchcraft trick called, uh, 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 it's called caromancy or seromancy. It's when you use wax and water to predict the future. You melt the wax into the water and you conjure certain spells over that combination and the wax begins to take form and shape and it shapes images that predict the future through demonic influence. So this caromancy is something that Balaam is skilled in. And it's almost like a crystal ball, but he uses this water basin with wax in it to, as though it were, uh, predict what's going to happen on the battlefield. And so in verse 10, and Balaam ordered that they should bring him wax. And he made thereof the likeness of chariots and horsemen representing the army of Angeas and the army of Egypt. And he, and he put them in the cunningly prepared waters that he had for the purposes. And he took in his hand and, and uh, the branches of myrtle trees and he exercised his cunning, his witchcraft. And he joined them over the water. And there appeared unto him in the water the resemblance, resembling images of the host of Angeas and the water he could see the two armies. And he saw the army of Angeas falling before the images of the Egyptians who were with the sons of Jacob. So Balaam uses this witchcraft. And he sees, just like the witch of Endor that Saul went to, he sees, whoo! The children of Israel getting the victory over the king of Africa. Now look at verse 11. And Balaam told this thing to King Angeas, and Angeas despaired and did not arm himself to go down to Egypt to battle. King Angeas said, oh no, oh no, I already had in my heart that I didn't want to fight. And now you done bumped your gums in my ears and got me all bucked and now I want to go fight. But I done called Balaam and Balaam done showed me what's going to happen. And I ain't going to fight the children of Israel. Therefore, you want to go fight? Go fight yourself. All right? So Zepho, who we talk about? Zepho, in verse 12, when Zepho, the son of Eliphaz, grandson of Esau, saw that Angeas despaired of going forth to battle, he didn't want to go fight the Egyptians. Look what Zepho did. Zepho fled from Angeas from Africa. You know your hate is bad. When you hate somebody so much that you can't provoke somebody else to go fight them, so they become your enemy too. And that's how mess and gossip is. That's how bitterness is. You're so bitter about somebody, everybody around you got to pick sides who they own. And if they won't be mad like you, you get mad at them. 
And so Zepho's anger, his hatred, turns on Angeas because he won't go fight. He breaks friendship with Angeas and he leaves. And this is where you need to tune in and pay attention. Where does the grandson of Esau, Zepho, go when he leaves the king of Africa? He goes to a place by the name of Chittim or Kittim. It says here in the book of Jasher, Zepho fled from Angeas from Africa, and he went and came to Chittim or Kittim. Pastor, what's Chittim? What's Kittim? Because sometimes they spell it in the K. You got to understand they change letters to confuse us because they don't want you to know what Chittim is. They don't want you to know what part of the world that is. But Pastor Omar is going to tell you what Chittim is. You see, Chittim, you can put it on the map. Chittim represents a small island by the name of Cyprus. But it's not just Cyprus. Chittim is also all those Japheth properties in the Mediterranean. It not only represents Cyprus, but it represents Greece. It also represents Italy. You see, that's, that's Cyprus. All right. In verse 13, if you can get 13 for me, we're going to come back to that same picture. In verse 13, and all the people of Chittim, what did they do? They received Zepho with great honor because he was a warrior. And Minister Duck, they were having problems in Chittim. The people in Africa, south of Chittim, the Mediterranean, separates Italy. Greece, Cyprus from Africa, Israel is on this side. They were going in to Chittim, southern Europe, and plundering. They were stealing. They were pirating. And the people of Chittim couldn't handle the Africans coming up and stealing from them. They needed a general. They needed a warrior. They needed somebody who knew how to fight. So when Zepho left Africa and went to Chittim, they received him. They received the grandson of Esau, Italy, Greece, oh God, Cyprus received the grandson of Esau like a hero. They say, come on in, because we're having a problem with the Africans. All right? And the people of Chittim received him with great honor, and they hired him to do what? To fight their battles. In case you don't know, the name Zepho means my God is gold. His name means my God is gold. That means that Zepho would fight anybody for a little bit of money. You see? He was tantamount to a hit man. All right? Zepho, a God, fights them. Now, we have a name, a geographical name in verse 13. You see it down there. It says Mount Kaptazia. Mount Kaptazia, very important name. Where is Mount Kaptazia? That's Mount Olympus on Cyprus Island. <laughs> show, us, show, us the, show us the map of Cyprus. I'm trying to show you where Chittim is, and I'm giving you geographical points and locations to show you that Chittim represents the island of Cyprus, Mount Kaptazia, Mount Olympus. And it also represents, amen, all of that Mediterranean, southern European section of the world. Where did Zepho go? He went to Chittim, all right? Look at verse 23. We, we going somewhere. I'm telling you, study with me. You want to know who Edom is, and we getting so close. We getting so close. 23. And at the revolution of the year... The troops of Africa continued coming to the land of Chittim to plunder as usual. Bunch of robbers and thieves out there, boy. They coming up there. Hey, God, you know how I go. They ain't stopped pirating. Listen, watch this. They going up to Chittim to plunder as usual. But look who's there. Zepho's there. <laughs> and Zepho, the son of Eliphaz, heard their report. And he gave orders concerning them. And he fought with them. And they fled before him. Now, Zepho is the perfect one to fight the king of Africa, and those that's coming up from his armies. Why? Because he was their general. 
And any time you take a player from another team and put him on your team, that player is going to know how to dismantle the team he just left. That's why I'm telling you, New England might have trouble with it since Tom Brady is in another place if we ever get back to football. You see? Because when you leave one team, you know what your old team good at and what they're not good at. You don't practice against that defense. Just to give you a, an analogy, a parable of sorts, that's Zephyr. He's the king of Africa's Tom Brady. And he go to another nation, another group of people, Chittim. And the king of Africa's people are coming up to plunder again. Zepho say, don't worry about it. I already know how they're rolling. I already know how they're rolling. I know exactly what to do to get them off your back. You see? And he fought them. And they fled before him. And he delivered the land of Chittim from them. Oh, it's getting good. Like Annalise say, it's getting juicy. Watch this. 24. And the children of Chittim saw that Zepho, who's Zepho? The grandson of Esau. They saw that, uh, they saw the valor of Zepho. And the children of Chittim resolved that they made Zepho, what did they make Zepho? King over them. Now who's Chittim? Italy, Greece, Cyprus, that whole Mediterranean region. Who did they make king over here them? Zepho. Who is Zepho? The grandson of Esau. All right. And look what Zepho does. And he became king over them. And whilst he reigned, he went to subdue the children of Tubal and all the surrounding areas. That whole Mediterranean area that we would call the Grecian Empire later. Zepho conquers all of that area, all those islands. It gets even better. In 25, the grandson of Esau and their king Zepho went at their head and they made war with Tubal and the islands. They subdued them and when they returned from the battle, they renewed the government for him and they built him a very large palace for his royal habitation and a seat. So now he goes from just a grandson of Esau, locked up in jail, now he the king of Chittim. And they made him a large throne. And Zepho reigned over the whole land of Chittim. And in case you haven't been getting the historical clues and context of what Chittim is, who's put a son, a grandson of Esau, as king over them, in case you hadn't got yet who Chittim, who, who Chittim is, it tells you, and he reigned over the whole land of Chittim and over the land of Italia 50 years. Chittim. It's not only Greece. It's not only Cyprus. It represents Italy as well. And there is an eternal city, as it's called in Italy. And that city is none other than Rome. We are told that the first kings of Rome was Romulus and Remus, two babies that was raised by a mother wolf. And we believe that like we believe Santa Claus, like we leave, believe the Easter Bunny. Like we believe the tooth fairy. Uh, there are other fables. It's time to get out of fables and get into fact. The first king of Rome wasn't uh, uh, two brothers uh, that was raised by a wolf. The first king of Rome was the grandson of Esau who had hatred. Eternal, perpetual hatred for the children of Israel. That prejudice, that hatred, that racism would never stop running through the blood of Edom and therefore never stop running through the blood of Rome. Esau's grandson is king over Italia, over Italy. You see? All right, and I have some other corroborating scriptures and, and commentaries. If you ever... Open the book of the Maccabees. First Maccabees 1.1, uh, 1 -1, you'll see Chittim referred to as this area of Greece. It talks about Alexander the Great and where he's from, which we know he's from Macedonia, Greece. But guess what they call where Alexander's from? They call it Chittim. They call Cyprus Chittim. They call I Italy Chittim. You see? Esau is reigning over Rome, right? 
Now, what would you do if you was the king of Africa? Zepho leaves you. You trying to plunder Chittim like you always do to get you some money. But now Zepho's there, and he's telling your enemy all your tactics. And you can't get paid no more through piracy and robbery. So the king of Africa, what you think he'd do? And now he got beef with, Zepho got beef with him because he just don't want to go to war with Israel. Why is you hating me, man? What happens when in the streets when that go down? Well, we know what's going to happen. That's beef. King of Africa says, Zepho won't handle me like that. And I've been good to him. I made him a general. And he hating on me. He blocking on me just because I don't want to fight his enemy. I'm coming for you, Zepho. I'm coming for you. So the king of Africa, watch this. He gathered all his army up, Deacon. Deacon Cordell. He gathered all his army up, and he, he riding out. He going he gonna to settle a score with his old general, Zepho. All right? And so in 6321, I hope y'all still paying attention out there, because this is the history of Edom right here. And if it's the history of Edom, Israel, watch this. It's your history, because it's the history of your enemy. And you'll never overcome your enemy unless you know your enemy and who they are and what they're doing. And so in 6321, it tells us, and Angus, king of Africa, and Lucas, his brother, he go get his brother. Brother, I got a problem. Y'all come home. We got to take care of some business. Arrayed all their forces, about 800,000 men, and they went against who? The children of Chittim. They going to get Zepho. They going to get him. You ain't met my brother Zepho, and if you met him, you ain't met him like you're about to meet him because, listen, we're about to handle some business, all right? I want you to watch closely what Zepho does in this context. And I want you to remember something about Zepho. He's the grandson of Esau, but remember who Esau is. Esau's daddy is Isaac. Esau's granddaddy is Abraham. And no matter how ratchet Esau is, and how ratchet Esau's grandson is, though your sins be red as scarlet, God will wash them white as snow. He's always ready for his children to turn back to him. So, Zepho's going to be, he's going to go to God in this context. Only temporarily, but he's going to go to God. Because he's in trouble. You ever met people that be in trouble and they go to God? And then when they get out of trouble, they leave God? That's Zepho. And Zepho relies upon his heritage. And I'm praying for the young people. Don't be a Zepho. Don't go to God relying upon the God of your grandpa, the God of your daddy. Don't go to God just when you're in trouble. God, remember my daddy. Remember my grandpa. Don't go to God just when you're in trouble. And then when you get out of trouble, you get away from God. So watch this. When the kings of Africa come in, they're coming at him. Malvo, they're coming at him. Watch this. And, 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 and 22. And all the children of Chittim, and it wasn't even Zepho's idea. Watch this. All the children of Chittim, they said unto Zepho, Zepho, pray for us. Pray for us to the God of thy ancestors. Peradventure, he may deliver us from the hand of King and Jesus and his army. For we have heard that he is a great God. What we was just worshiping about, his greatness. Huh? The children of Chittim say, Zepho, let me remind you who you are. Pray to the God of your ancestors because he is a great God. And that he delivers all who do what? Who trust in him. You see? And Zepho say, that's a good idea. In 23, Zepho, grandson of Esau, Esau, son of Isaac, Isaac, son of Abraham, Zepho heard their words, and Zepho sought the Lord and said, 24, O Lord, o Lord God of Abraham and Isaac. Now when we pray, we say God of who? Abraham, Isaac, and what? Jacob. But he don't mention no Jacob. Even his prayer is laced with hate. Even his prayer is laced with prejudice. And that's why they don't understand sometimes when we would have prayer, I would watch people pray, and I can hear the feelings, the hurt, the bitterness, even the sin 
that's in your prayers. He said, Abraham and Isaac, not mentioning Jacob. Other thing is he don't mention his daddy or his grandpa. He could have said the God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Esau, but Esau, Esau ain't served God. He stopped at Isaac. Look what he said. He said, God of Abraham, uh, uh, God of Isaac, my ancestors, this day I know that thou art a true God. All the gods of the nations are vain and useless. Remember now this day unto me thy covenant with Abraham our father, which our ancestors related unto us, and do graciously with me this day for the sake of Abraham and Isaac our fathers. And save me and the children of Chittim from the hand of who? The king of Africa who comes against us for battle. What color y'all think skin this king of Africa have? Black? Oh yeah, he's a black man. I'll show you in a second. All right. And the Lord hearkened to the voice of Zepho. You say, why did God listen to him? Because of Abraham and because of Isaac. And the Lord listened to the voice of Zepho, and he had regard for him on account of who? Abraham and Isaac. And the Lord delivered Zepho and the children of Chittim from who? From the hand of Angeas and his people. What happened, Pastor? When Angeas came to fight Zepho for stopping his money game, he came with an army large, him and his brother, Zepho beat them both because he called upon the most high God of Abraham and Isaac. Remember, Zepho is a descendant of Shem. Zepho is a descendant of Abraham. Zepho is a descendant of Isaac. And no Gentile army is going to be the descendant of Abraham and Isaac. Not when God is on their side. See, that's the blessing of being a descendant of Abraham and Isaac. Esau against the Gentiles, they have no chance because Esau is a descendant of Abraham and Isaac. Let's get into some deeper stuff. Y'all ready? Put on your seatbelt. After Zepho de defeats the king of Africa, what used to happen in the hood? Huh? They beat you in front of everybody. What you going to do the next day? We going to fight again? I ain't going to just let you handle me like that. Oh, no. It, it wasn't my day, but come on. Today is another day. All right? King Angeas come back with a bigger army. And guess what Zepho do to him again? Beat him again. 35, verse 35. And Angeas and Lucas, his brother, fled with the rest of their men, and they escaped and came into Africa with terror and consternation. And Angeas feared all the days lest Zepho, the son of Eliphaz, should go to war with him. And Jesus said, I don't want no more Zepho. He done beat me twice, and I had the numbers on him. I'm not messing with Zepho and Chittim again. All right? Can I take a sidebar for a second with you? This is for our historians. This king, Angeas, though he is beaten by Zepho, follow me now, he's beaten by Zepho, and he's beaten by Zepho badly, all right? And Zepho is the king over Italy, Greece, and Cyprus, all right? But what most people don't know, King Angeas has a son. Who? He has two sons, actually. And the book of Jasher tells us later, it's just a sidebar, I'm going to get back to Zepho. The book of Jasher tells us the name of the son of this king of Africa, of Angeas. One of his sons would go down in history as being one of the greatest generals in the history of mankind. No matter what school of war you attend, no matter what military training you get, you will always study this man, this son of King Aegeus. Uh, uh, let me get his, right, his name right. Uh, Angeus. The general, the son of Angeus' name is a man by the name of Hannibal. Hannibal. Hannibal the Great. Hannibal of Carthage. All right? I'm going to tell you something about Hannibal. Hannibal grew up hating Chittim because Chittim defeated his daddy. Chittim killed his brother. 
So Hannibal hated Chittim. Hannibal the Great is the only man in history to march up the coast of the Mediterranean. He crossed the Alps because Italy is protected by a mountain range called the Alps. Hannibal crossed the Alps. And what did Hannibal cross the Alps with? He crossed the Alps with elephants. <laughs> to this day, they can't figure out how Hannibal crossed the Alps with war elephants. You see, Hannibal, the king of Africa, succeeded his daddy. And one of the things they did in Africa, they didn't just fight with horses. They, got, they used what was called war elephants. And when the Romans saw the war elephants of Hannibal's, who would use the tusk to sweep the military uh, uh, ground and just destroy cavalry, destroy infantry. Amen. They couldn't handle this black king of Africa. Now throughout history, watch this, Hannibal was always painted as a white man. And since we never studied to show ourselves approved, we always thought that the greatest of men, the greatest of generals always had a pigmentation that was of a lighter sort. But up until about 2016, 2017, the son of King and Jesus was finally given his color back. The History Channel, amen, began to do things about him and they allowed a black man to play his role because sooner or later, we're going to find out who's black and who's not. And even before the History Channel put a black man in the role of Hannibal, I don't know if y'all remember that calendar, but I do. When I was lost, Budweiser put out a calendar. It went out for Black History Month into all the black family residences. They did a calendar that had the kings of Africa on it. And who was on the picture of the kings of Africa? Hannibal, the son of King Angeus. He would go and fight Chittim later. Fight Rome after Zepho was gone. And Deacon, he marched up into Rome with the war elephants, and he put the Romans to flight. We hear of Rome as being unconquerable, but Hannibal conquered Rome. He not only conquered Rome from the north to the south of Rome. He stayed in Rome 15 years, and they couldn't get him out. The only reason this brother left because he was homesick, and he left, and he went back to his home Carthage, North Africa, as king of Africa, in peace, and they didn't touch Carthage or anything else until that brother was gone. You see? A beautiful, awesome historical study. And guess where Hannibal is? He's not only in our history books, he's not only in the book of Josephus, he is in the book of Jasher. They just take the H off his name so that we won't know that it's him. Hannibal the Great. Hannibal of Carthage. And we know that he's black. Um, Phil and, and, and Brent just flashed to you one of the coins that they found during his legacy. Look at them cornrows. Look at that hat. Look at that nose. Look at them lips. Oh, yeah. And look at the elephants because that's what he was famous for. He brought the war elephants as a new tactical strategy to put to flight the enemies of Chittim. Oh, Rome fell once. Rome fell once, friends. Chittim was defeated once. Oh, yeah. They remember Hannibal the Great. Come on, give y'all some glory in this house. Amen. Come on, give him some glory. All right. All right. Listen, we're almost done. Let's go back to Zepho. Let's go back to Zepho. That was just a sidebar. I wanted to teach y'all some history and why, why King uh, Angeus was so important. Amen. He's actually the father of Hannibal the Great. Um, um, in Jasher 64... In verse 1, watch this, going back to where we were, Zepho beats King Aegeus twice. All right? Now, Balaam, remember, he was with <coughs> the king of Africa, giving him an advice and using witchcraft and stuff like that. But when Balaam sees that the power is no longer with the king of Africa, but is with Zepho, all right? Guess what Balaam does? He switches sides. He goes from the king of Africa, King Angeus, he switches sides. He goes to Chittim. He goes to King Zepho. 
And in Joshua 64, 1, it tells us, And Balaam the son of Beor was at the time with Angeas in the battle. And when he saw that Zephyr prevail, what he did? He fled from there and came to Chedham. Oh, no, I'm going to be on the winning side, Balaam said. In verse 5, And Zephyr, Zephyr forgets God, y'all. It was God that gave him the victory over King Angeas. In verse 5, But Zephyr remembered not the Lord. And considered not that the Lord had helped him in battle and that he had delivered him and his people from the hand of king of Africa, but still walk in the ways of who? The children of Chittim, idolatry, and the wicked children of Esau. And in this verse, look what it says. It has an awesome adage right here. It says, from the wicked goes forth wickedness. You see how merciful our God is? Our God helped him even though he knew that Zepho was just calling on him in trouble. God knew that Zepho was going to turn back, but still gave him his mercy, gave him his grace, even though he didn't deserve it. You see? So Zepho wins a battle. Now, y'all, what happens when you win a battle to your head? Your head get big. Your head get big. You done beat that man, hey, God in the hood. You done beat that man with one arm. Now you think you might Tyson. You think you could beat Debo? You think you could beat everybody in the hood now? Right? What you think Zepho does after he beat the king of Africa, after he subdued the southern Mediterranean islands, after he's sitting as king, what you think come back into Zepho's heart? His hate for Israel. And he said to himself, I couldn't get the king of Africa to go and fight Israel, but now I'm king. Now I have an army. Now I have a people. And I'm not only king, but I done beat the king of Africa. I'm going to settle an old score with the boys that killed my grandpa, that took our land, that stole our blessing, and that put me in that Egyptian prison for all those years. Zepho comes after Israel. Zion, this is your history. Pay attention closely. The Bible is going to make perfect sense after you get this particular part of history. In verse 7 of the book of Joshua 64, At that time Zepho had returned from the war, when Zepho had seen he, how he prevailed over all the people of Africa. He smitten them in battle with the edge of the sword. Then Zepho advised the children of Chittim to go to Egypt to fight with the sons of Jacob and with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Zepho, stop tripping. You were king now. You got a whole people under you. Why is you still beefing with Israel? It's generational bondage. Do you know that your enemy could have everything and you have nothing and they still hate you and still jealous of you? He a king, y'all. Israel is pretty much servants moving to slavery in Egypt. Why even worry about them, you know? But that's how strong hate is. That's how strong generational bondage is. That's why we got to get rid of it in our individual lives, but we also have to get rid of it as a nation. You see? Never hate nobody. Never hate another nation. Israel never hated Esau. Esau always hated Israel. You see? Because hate takes you somewhere. Hate destroys you. It's a fire that's unquenchable until it destroys you or the people that you hate. And after it destroys the people you hate, it still won't be quenched until it destroys you. So here we go. Zepho wants to go to war. Verse 8, watch this. And Zepho heard that the mighty men of Egypt were dead. <laughs> he heard that Pharaoh was dead. Joseph was dead, Carlos. He heard that Levi was dead. He heard that Simeon was dead. He heard that Judah was dead. He said, oh, oh they ain't got no help. They ain't got no help at all. And that uh, Joseph and all his brothers, sons of Jacob were dead. And that all the, the children and the children of Israel, they were still in Egypt. Verse 9. And Zepho considered to go fight against them in all Egypt. To avenge, this is the reason he wanted to fight. To avenge the cause of his brethren, the children of Esau, 
whom Joseph with his brother in all Egypt had smitten, had beaten in the land of Canaan when they went up to bury Jacob in Hebron. This is the beef right here. This is still the beef in verse 9. All right? All right? Generational bondage. Now, from verses 10 through 14, all right? We're not going to go through it, but what Zepho does, he has all Chittim with him. He calls his brothers from Edom, southern Israel. Y'all come on with me. They bring Ishmael. They bring Moab. They bring all the eastern kingdoms. So you got all the Mediterranean. You got all the neighbors of Israel. And they all come and fight Israel in Egypt. Verse 15. And Zepho sent to all the children of the east and to all the children of Ishmael with words like unto these. And they gathered themselves and came to the assistance of Zepho and the children of Chittim in the war upon Egypt. 16. And all these kings, the kings of Edom, the children of east, and all the children of Ishmael, and Zepho, the king of Chittim, went forth, arrayed all their hosts in Hebron, I got in my notes, it's going down, it's going down. All right? Now, us Bible scholars, watch this. We've been reading our Bible all our lives, Carlos, and we never knew that while Israel was in Egypt, Esau and the other children of the east came to fight against us while we were still in Egypt. We never knew this. And this fact is going to unlock mysteries in our Bible, all right? They came to fight against us, all right? All right? Psalm 83, go down to verse 4. It says, they have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation. That's the heart of Esau, and it has never changed that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with what? One consent. They are, what's that word? Confederate against thee. What an awesome word to use, huh? You know, they had another army that wanted to keep us in slavery. They are confederate against thee. You see? You think these names mean nothing to God? You see? He goes on in the psalm, but let's get back to the battle right here. So in Joshua 64, 19, come on, tell your neighbor it's going down, it's going down. <laughs> it's about to be a fight, all right? And we're going to do like they used to do in the schoolyard. We're going to gather around and watch the fight. You see? In Joshua 64, 19, and all Egypt heard their report. And they also gathered themselves together, all the people of the land of Egypt and all the cities belonging to Egypt, about 300,000 men. So Egypt said, you ain't come and deal with no Israel in our land. So Egypt did the right thing. They said, well, you won't fight Israel. Come on, fight us too. So Egypt said, let's do this thing. Verse 20, and the men of Egypt sent also to the children of Israel who were in those days in the land of Goshen. They say, Israel, y'all come on. Come on, y'all, enemy's coming. Let's do this thing. Let's fight, man. You know? In 23, the Egyptians have a council. And Deacon Vinny, they have a council, and they talk a little bit. And they come up with something in their mind. They wanted Israel to fight on first, but the devil kind of tricked them up. In 23, look what they say. And the Egyptians believe not in Israel to go with them in their camps together for battle. For all the Egyptians said, perhaps the children of Israel will deliver us into the hand of the children of Esau and Ishmael, for they are their brethren. Remember, we are relatives of Esau by way of Jacob, and we are relatives with Ishmael by way of Isaac through Hagar, who had Ishmael. And the Egyptians say, this might be a trick. We might go over there and fight against 
Ishmael against Edom, and Israel turn on us for their cousins. So the Egyptians tell Israel, ah, uh, y'all stay home. We're going to fight this. This is a problem. Remember who Esau is. Esau is a descendant of Abraham and Isaac. And if you don't have Abraham and Isaac in your blood, there is no way you could defeat the descendants of Abraham and Isaac. A regular Gentile fighting against a descendant of Abraham and Isaac doesn't have a chance because there is a blessing if you have Abraham in your blood. There is a blessing if you have Isaac in your blood. There is a blessing, a greater blessing, if you got Jacob in your blood. The Egyptians make a spiritual error that's going to come back to bite them. They go out to fight Esau without Jacob. They go out to fight Edom without Israel. Because the only one who could defeat Esau is Jacob. The only one who could defeat Edom is Israel. Woo! Edom shall reign until the end. And after the end, what follows is Jacob. It's either going to be one or the other that's going to reign. Oh, I think that was too deep for y'all. All right, here we go. Let's watch this fight. 24. And all the Egyptians said unto the children of Israel, remain you here together in your stand, and we will go and fight against the children of Esau and Ishmael. We're going to take care of them. And if these kings should prevail over us, then come you all together upon them and assist us. We're going to call y'all if we need some help, but we got that. All right? 31. And all the Egyptians come out, y'all. They come out with their chariots. You know how the Egyptians roll, boy. They got their linen on. They come out. They got them chariots, boy. And they rolling out there, boy, but Chittim is out there. Italy, Greece, Cyprus, huh, huh? The kingdom of Edom out there, they brethren with, 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 with Esau, uh, 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 with Zepho, and, and they out there with, with the Ishmaelites, Moab, Ammon, they, they all out there, everybody out there. And they lined up in battle. I wish I would have showed you a map. Did I give you the map uh, where the battlefield was? It, was? it was right near where the Sinai is going to meet Amen. The Nile Delta in a place called Taphanes. And that's, that's where the battle was. And they're about to get down. They're about to get down. It's about to go down. They lined up. It's on. All right. And so here we go. Here we go. Here we go. In 33, 31, 31. And all the Egyptians fought with these kings opposite of Pathros and, and Taphanes. And the battle was severe, but it was severe against the Egyptians. The Egyptians got it handed to them, man. They were getting whipped, all right? 33, and the Egyptians cried unto the children of Israel, saying, hasten, hurry, come quickly to us and assist us and save us from the hand of Esau. You can't beat Esau without Jacob. Save us from the hand of Ishmael. You can't beat Ishmael without Isaac. And save us from the children of Chittim, the only one that can beat Rome is Zion. You see? And Egypt calls upon the children of Israel. 34. And the children of Israel, 150 men of the children of Israel, ran from their station, their position, to the camps of these kings. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord their God. Ooh, you see what a favor is? Egypt cried to us. But who we cried to? God. 150 of us come running out there. All built like Carlos, tall and look. You understand what I'm saying? Coming out there. Some of them built like me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but, but they all out there, all right? So, so watch this, watch this. So they cried unto the Lord to deliver them. 35, and the Lord hearkened to Israel. Now, I'm going to stop right there because I need to make it, I need to make it thematic. I, I, need, I, need to, I need to give you a little cinema drama, drama right here. We sent 150 of our men out there. All right? But you got to understand who Israel is. You got to understand what our blood look like. You got to understand if we got 150 of our best out there, what that's going to be like. I want you to picture LeBron James out there. You understand what I'm saying? I want you to picture, amen, hallelujah, uh, 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 people like, hey, God, Dennis Rodman out there. I want you to picture, amen, them seven-footers, uh, uh, Patrick Ewan out there. I want you to picture Israel out there, all right? Let's get back.
basketball. Let's go to football. I want you to picture Ray Lewis out there. I want you to picture Bo Jackson out there, thighs the size of trees. I want you to picture, woo! You understand what I'm saying? Walter Payton. I want you to picture, huh? Picture them guys, huh? Aaron Donald out there. I want you to picture Israel out there. Our best out there. Let's move on from basketball uh, to from football. Let's move on to boxing. I want you to imagine Mike Tyson going out there. It's totally ludicrous, man. It's totally ludicrous. I want you to picture Muhammad Ali out there. I want you to picture Deontay Wilder out there. I want you to picture, amen, as though it was, hallelujah, Anthony, Anthony, A. Joshua out there. And I want you to picture all of these men, hallelujah, who represent our bloodline right with God, in covenant with God, praying with God, asking for God's favor, and God's favor on their life, and now they come in the fight. See, it's one thing to fight Deontay Wilder, but fight him while he's under the favor of God. Fight him while he's under the blood. Fight him while he's called upon Yahshua to save his souls. Fight him when he knows who he is and that he's not just a slave, African-American born in oppression, but he's actually a king of Zion. He's actually a prince of, of Israel. And fight him when he knows who he is and when he knows whose he is. It's a different thing when the people of Yah who have natural talent, skill, strength above any other nation on earth it's another thing to fight that people, play against that people, when they're in right relationship with God. There's 150 come out there in right standing with God. They out there with LeBron at their head. I'm just telling you all that just to show you all a picture. LeBron is not at their head. I'm just telling you all that. And they come out there 150. And they got their cousins on the other side, Esau. And Chittam, they ain't saw each other in a long time, but you know what happened to you the last time you saw me. You see? And so they go to war. Y'all ready for the battle? Watch this, watch this. And the 150 men of the children of Israel ran from their station to the camps of the kings, and they cried unto the Lord, 35. And the Lord hearkened to Israel. And the Lord gave all the men of the kings into their hand. And the children of Israel fought against these kings. And the children of Israel smote about 4,000 of the king's men. 150 of them big boys out there. Tearing things up. You understand what I'm saying? They, they tearing it up. Each of them taking about 30 of them out by themselves. One will put 1,000 to flight. Two will put 10,000 to flight. That's been the story of our heritage. They tearing it up. They tearing it up out there. You see? In 36, and the Lord threw a great consternation in the camp of the kings so that the fear of the children of Israel fell upon them. Ain't nobody, want, they, they didn't want to fight no more. They saw Mike Tyson out there licking his lips. Come on, come on, you want to fight? Come on. They said, we don't want to fight no more. And Zepho and all of them, amen, hallelujah, they turned back in 39. And when the Egyptians saw that the children of Israel had fought, this is the key. Brian, watch this. This is the key. This is the key to understanding our Bible and understanding the travesty, understanding what went on with us in Egypt. This is it. When the Egyptians saw that the children of Israel had fought with such few men, with the kings, and that the battle was so very severe against them, they had more men. We had few and all the Egyptians were greatly afraid of their lives on account of the strong battle. And all Egypt fled. They went to battle with stronger numbers than us, and they was afraid. They ran. Every man hiding himself from the arrayed forces, and they hid themselves, and they left the Israelites to fight alone. This is what happened. Israel come out 150. They tanned the kings down. And I don't know if you ever saw Hebrews fight. It's not like regular fighting. It's scary. <laughs> it's nothing choreographed. You understand what I'm saying? It's, too, it's like two lions meeting, you know? And that's how the Hebrews were fighting. And the Egyptians were like, I didn't know fighting looked like that. You see? And so they ran, all right? Now, in 41, watch this, and the children of Israel inflicted a terrible blow upon the king's men. 
And they returned from them after they had driven them to the border of the land of Cush. They drove the kings in Zepho back into the land of Cush, back towards Ethiopia. Y'all get out of here. All right? 150 of them. Watch this. This is the history right here. 43. So the children of Israel also acted with cunning. Now, we probably shouldn't have done this, but I'm going to share with you what we did. All right? You know if you go to fight and your boss say, I got your back, and he run, and he leave you with more numbers, that's probably not going to be your boy no more. Because you're going to look and you're going to say, I thought we was going to do this together. And you let them boys jump me. Good thing the law was on my side and I was able to come out. But I ain't going to battle with you no more, dog. Israel was mad. They was mad that Egypt left them on the battlefield. So the children of Israel also acted with cunning. As the children of Israel returned from battle, they found some of the Egyptians in the road. And look what Israel did. And they smote the Egyptians there. They shouldn't have done it. I don't think they should have done it. All right. And while they slew them, they said unto one another these words. Wherefore did you go from us and leave us? Being a few people to fight against these kings who had great people to smite us that you might de thereby deliver your own. You left us when we was outnumbered because you was only thinking about yourself. That's what Israel told the Egyptians. And they began to kill the Egyptians out there on that roadway. You see? And you got to understand the bloodline of Israel. When you look at L Simeon and Levi, Israel can have a bad temper sometimes. Once you get them going. When you rouse the line up, who going to stop him? You see? They done beat the mother boy. They want to fight some more, so they fight the Egyptian. You see? 47. And the children of Israel did these things cunningly. We're almost done. Against the Egyptians because they had deserted them in the battle and fled from them. All right? And all the men of Egypt saw the evil which the children of Israel had done to them. And this is where I wanted to get at. I, I, I was kind of getting to it too early. They saw the evil that the children of Israel had done to them. So all Egypt feared greatly the children of Israel. Not just because of the evil, but watch this. For they had seen their great power. And that not one man of them, not one of the 150, had fallen fighting against all those kings. And this is where we get to Exodus, our last scripture. Exodus 1-9. We don't understand it until we get into Jasher. Exodus 1-9, we see Pharaoh saying unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. This is why they say that. They just watch 150 of these Bo Jackson, LeBron James, and Mike Tyson's whip thousands. They say they're more mighty than us. Come on. Let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. Therefore did they set over them taskmasters to afflict them with burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. We're going to get off into the Exodus next time. And when you come next time, I am going to show you just not Exodus. We're we, we, we not going to even deal with, but I'm going to show you what happens next in Egypt. And I'm going to show you parts of the story that's in Josephus, parts of the story that's in Jasher that we hadn't got yet. And it's parts that we need because we are in Egypt again. It's parts that they don't want us to know because God is about to move again. He don't want us to see how mighty we are. The enemy I'm talking about. The devil don't want us to see how mighty we are. But we turn on the TV before Corona every Sunday and watch our men 
outdo the men of other races. We watch teams of football teams, teams of basketball teams. We watch how fast, how strong, how, how tactical, how, how accurate from half court. We watch, we watch that, and we see that on the sports, but what you have not translated that is, you ain't seen that fight. You ain't seen that fight. You ain't seen that, that those muscle twitches. You ain't seen that how that big man can move his hips, how that big man could be 2, 250, 280 and still be fast. You ain't, you ain't seen that fight. You ain't seen that on one accord. You ain't seen that as a nation. You ain't seen that with the favor of God. And I'm going to show you that. I'm going to show you that in the scriptures, and I'm going to show you that next time we come, and I'm going to show you how much fear that put in the nations of men. We talked about Zepho today. Next time we come, we're going to talk about us in Egypt. We're going to talk a little bit more about the Exodus. Let's have a word of prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I tell you what, I'm going to wait to pray. And, and uh, 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 Carlos was jumping on this, uh, uh, back there. He was enjoying the message. So, but, but here we go. All right. When. Remember, Balaam is our enemy. Balaam goes from the king of Africa to Chittim. <laughs> because Chittim beat Africa. Well, Egypt, with our help, just beat Chittim. Where do you think Balaam going to go? Balaam is going to go to Egypt. And Balaam is going to be advising the new Pharaoh on how to deal with Israel. Our perpetual nemesis. Why you think, I'm, I'm about to get on it, but why you think when Moses threw his rod down, guess who was ready with his rod to? But we're going to get into it. I don't want to give you too much. I don't want to get too much. Let's have a word of prayer. Carlos was jumping back there. Carlos, you was enjoying that, Carlos? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Most high God, I thank you so much for our history. And our history is his story, your story. Now, God, make us students. Make us love hearing about our story. For so long we have been taught that we had no history, that we had no home, that we had no achievements, no battles, no victories. But, oh, God, we thank you that what's been hidden from us is now being revealed. Now, King, I pray that you would raise up again your people, Israel. Raise us up again and get us right with you. I pray for all those brothers that I just named, the super talented, super athletic, the great of our kind. I pray that one by one you begin to move upon their lives. Even now as they are in lock in I pray that you meet them all I thank you for the Mike Tysons and the LeBron James and I thank you Lord God for the Anthony Joshua's I thank you for the Deontay Wilders and now God I pray for our chief men across the nation those Lord God who are athletically sound those Lord God who are talented even in the art of music I pray for our stars I pray for our nobles I pray for them that's in academia who teaching in colleges not only strong with their body but strong with their minds I pray for the best of Israel right now in my prayer, I pray that you would begin to draw them, begin to pull them, begin to reel them in unto you while they are home alone. Bring them back to your word, O oh King. Let them open up the Bibles. Let them remember what Grandma say and Great Grandma say. Draw them, Yah. We pray we begin to hear about the prayers of these great men and great women. Begin to hear them call out. Begin to go to the cross. Now, Lord, now, Lord, draw Israel, God. As you promised you would in these last days. That we would not be cast out forever. Draw Israel God. We need our great men and women. Once again draw Israel God. Draw them. Draw them. Draw them. 
and draw them to the cross. Draw them to the cross. Some kind of way, get this video to them. Draw them to the cross. There are some listening who have an ear of these great, prolific men and women, hallelujah, of Israel. Get this video to them. Get this video to them. Get this message to them. For the Hebrew nobility must rise again. Our chiefs must rise again. But we can only rise when you are right with God. And there's only one way to be right with God. And that's through his son, Yahshua. I thought his name was Jesus. His Hebrew name is Yahshua. And his Hebrew name deciphers the color of who he is. His hair like wool, his feet like brass. Warrior, he looks like you, he talks like you, he sounds like you, he, he is of your people. And listen to me. He calls out for you now. He says you haven't been given all that you have for nothing. He's raised you up in this Gentile world for such a time as this to save you and to use you to raise up God's people to raise up your people you've been feeling it already that's why you've been standing up for your people already you've been feeling it you've been feeling it you were born for such a time such a time such a time as this Woman of God, you are our Esther. Whoo! Man of God, you are our Moses, is our Joshua's. You're our Jehoshaphat's, our Hezekiah's. Hey! Call upon him. Call upon him. And now you're telling me, but Pastor, you don't know all the wrong I've done. Hey, I'm telling you, it doesn't matter. Though your sins be red as scarlet, he'll wash them as white as snow. You don't know the people I done left behind, the people I done did wrong. Don't worry about what you've done. He's going to forgive you. He's going to love you. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death without him. But the gift of God is eternal life and peace and forgiveness but it's only through his son Yahshua Hamashiach Jesus the Messiah believe with me that your God son of man from your bloodline And that man died on the cross as a sacrifice for all of your sins in your room. He was buried in the grave. But just like our book says, the grave could never hold him. He rose on the third day. And when he rose, he said, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be forgiven shall be given eternal life so pray with me now say father Yahweh I'm a sinner forgive me of all my sins I believe you died on the cross you were buried in the grave and on the third day you rose. Most high, save me, a sinner. And you, tell him I don't mind being Ruth. Woo. I don't mind being Rahab. I just want to be on the right side of history. So use me for your purpose and your people. In Yahshua, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Come on, give y'all some glory. Come on, give y'all some glory. Hallelujah. I'm going to get out of here, but 
But next time when we come, hey God, I want you to do a little homework. Look up Zepho on Wikipedia. They're going to spell his name Zepho with an N on the end, Zephon, and they're going to tell you who he is. One of the first Latin kings. Just look him up. Just look him up, but I'm not going to keep y'all. I'm going to go. Team, y'all did a good job. Love y'all. May the Lord bless you. May he keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and bless you. Be gracious to you. Bless you with shalom, peace. Let him worship for a little while, feel while the people just enjoy it. While they say la upon the word of the Most High. Come back and see me. Shalom. Love y'all. Come on, you might think. Thank you. Hey, you may think. Come on. Come on, you're going to make me stay in worship. <laughs> they thought we were surrounded. Zepho thought we were surrounded. <laughs> they didn't know we had them Hebrew hitmen. Come on, it may look like. Come on. Worship. Worship. They don't know who our God is. They don't know who our God is. They don't know who I've got in. Hey, hey. This is how, this is how I fight my battle. Come on. This is how I fight my battle. Go to the Lord, Israel. This is how I fight my battle. Come on. This is how I. Hey, they don't want you to this fight. This is how I fight my battle. Come on, get in that word. This is how I fight my battle. Come on, go to the Lord. Prayer. This is how I find my battles. Worship, praise. This is how I. Ooh. Shalom, shalom. Yeah, my victories in Jesus' name. Yeah, my victories in Jesus' name. Yeah. My victories in Jesus' name. Yeah. My victories in Jesus' name. Yeah. My victories in Jesus' name. My victories in Jesus' name. Bye.